Hey everyone, Jared here, and today we're talking about the black hole that devoured weeks of my life, Fallout 4. Like many of its predecessors, Fallout 4 follows a vault dweller bravely traversing the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Unlike Fallout 3, which features a vault dweller in search of his father, Fallout 4 chronicles a weird inverted Oedipal scenario where you kill your son and destroy his legacy. All Fallout games feature super mutants, death claws, and feral ghouls menacing the human race. But in Fallout 4, there's a new danger synthetic humans. And while the perils of the wasteland still pose an existential threat to humankind, Fallout 4 introduces a new purely philosophical threat, that is, what does it mean to be human? Through the synths, the game makes us question everything we know about our very humanity. Welcome to Wisecrack Edition on the philosophy of Fallout 4. The Synth Creating Institute serves as the primary antagonist to the rest of the Commonwealth. The Institute was built when the surviving scientists of a fictionalized MIT, known as CIT, dug themselves underground to shield themselves from the ravages of the irradiated surface. Dedicating themselves to research and the advancement of humanity, they quickly scrapped their plans to improve life on the surface and instead opted to create serene waterfalls and creepy synthetic children. The Institute's synth program draws suspicion from the inhabitants of the Wasteland, who believe correctly that the Institute is replacing their loved ones with synthetic counterparts. What have you done with the real Riley? Where's my brother? It also sets them at odds with the Railroad, who believe the synths are sentient and being exploited by the Institute, and the Brotherhood of Steel, who feel the synthetic humanoids are another case of technology gone too far. The fundamental question about synths and our relation to them falls into two camps. There's humanism, a philosophy centered on, surprise, the human, and posthumanism, the deconstruction and decentering of what it means to be human. As the player, one choice faced in the game is to believe, as Father does, that the synths are mere robots. Or you can believe, as the Railroad does, that because they've developed sentience, they're deserving of rights. We could see the synth storyline as an uninspired lazy cliché about discrimination. I'd never be friends with a damn synth. But it also does a great job of exploring the line between human and non-human. Nowhere is this divide explored more explicitly than in the ideology of the Brotherhood of Steel and their opposition to the Institute. The Brotherhood are, for lack of better term, synth racists. Shoot the kill. They believe the cybernetic organisms are an abomination to nature. The synth, a robotic abomination of technology that is free-thinking and masquerades as a human being. And it's not just the fear of them being used by the Institute to spy on society. Even the rebellious synths, shepherded to freedom by the railroad, are targets of Maxon's soldiers. If we intend to end the synth menace, we need to plug the leaks. Walking around Brotherhood territory with Valentine, an early version synth, subjects you to a deeply unsettling level of harassment. Don't get any ideas, synth. The Brotherhood ride around on the Pridwin led by a guy named Arthur, a reference to the ship and hero of the Tales of King Arthur. Their ranks emulate medieval Europe with titles like Knight, Paladin, Scribe, and Squires. This is perhaps the best indication of how they perceive themselves. Chivalrous knights out to battle monsters and protect the helpless remains of humanity and its purity. The Brotherhood adopts a kind of classical morality. They believe in the human as a pure, inherently valuable entity worth defending. Conceived in a womb by a loving mother, al natural, you get the idea. They can be roughly described as humanist. Now, there are tons of different kinds of humanisms who all believe different things, but we're really just using the term humanist to stress a level of assumptions they share with the other humanists. That there is a basic human nature, and that the human, as opposed to the inhuman, are the primary subjects of the world. If the Brotherhood is so bothered by synths, it's because this amalgam of man and machine threatens the very identity that defines them and the humanity they seek to defend. Flesh is flesh. Machine is machine. The two were never meant to intertwine. Long before the Brotherhood, humanity was obsessed with defining themselves by what they are not. We're not like animals because we use tools, think abstractly, and use emojis. Back in the days of ancient Greece, this anxiety mainly manifested itself in interspecies creatures like centaurs and minotaurs. The combination of species disrupted the traditional boundaries of Greek society between man and animal, polis and nature, etc. Today, that anxiety about the boundaries of the human creeps into our relationship with technology. Instead of human versus animal, it's more like human versus animal slash machine slash microbes slash holy shit the world is scary stuff. A quick survey of the sci-fi genre will reveal a ton of movies scared shitless about human genetic manipulation, machines overtaking humans, machines fucking humans, you get the idea. In her essay, The Cyborg Manifesto, philosopher Donna Haraway investigates our construction of the human and how this chasm between organism and machine is always enforced by a kind of border war. 
We defend the figure of the human against degradations, impurities, infections, and so on. By attempting to play God, the Institute has taken the sanctity of human life and corrupted it beyond measure. It shouldn't be surprising to learn that back in the day, people argued that dialysis was an unsavory attempt to play God, an unholy marriage between man and machine. Life-saving technologies are often considered undignified. Is he still right? Oh no, no. He has health problems. Uh -huh. In order to preserve their idea of pure humanity, the Brotherhood wants to exterminate the synths, who threaten these boundaries. The Brotherhood's defense of the human isn't all that new, and their response to synths isn't too surprising. They're essentially railing against miscegenation, or the mixing of races, using the same invocations of purity in nature that have always worked so well when being dicks to entire groups of people. However, the Brotherhood's idea of human is deeply flawed and full of contradictions. It's here that Fallout gets pretty smart, even if inadvertently. The game, through the Brotherhood of Steel, shows the distinction between human and inhuman isn't so black and white. I don't recognize you. And calls into question several myths surrounding the very idea of the human. The first myth the Brotherhood runs into is about the purity of the human body, shunning the mixture of flesh and machine as we discussed earlier. The problem is, they're literally cyborgs. If you want to rail against the post-human, let's talk about your suits of power armor that you wear around everywhere. The power armor enhances the human body like any implant could. It can augment your vision, your strength, for Proctor Ingram, it even fills the void of the missing legs she lost in battle. For Haraway, this boundary is always a fiction, and the biggest enforcers of the border between human and inhuman are gleefully ignorant of how porous that border is. Those things that make us human, using tools, language, etc., are seen in both apes and birds. We're also molded, according to Haraway, by the environment. Will the Commonwealth corrupt you? as it has everything else. In real life, the pure human body is full of foreign DNA and bacteria. Likewise, the radiation wreaking havoc on the DNA of wasteland survivors makes them as impure as the synths created with untainted DNA from Sean. The second myth is about human nature and morality. Uh. Maxon argues against Dance's humanity on the grounds that those ethics that it's striving to champion aren't even its own. They were artificially inserted in an attempt to have it blend into society. For many humanists, there's either a human nature which makes us innately good, or at the very least, a free will which enables the possibility of ethics. Unlike animals or machines, we can choose to be virtuous. Maxon criticizes Dance for having artificially inserted ethics. The irony of this, coming from a man raised in a heavily regimented military organization, where higher powers dictate a code of ethics to a set of subordinates, seems to be lost on him. If you intend to stay within our ranks, you need to obey our tenets without question. For Haraway, our entire being is crafted by the culture, societies, and environment that we come into contact with. For instance, exploring Kellogg's memories and his traumatic upbringing can tell us as much about who he is as his cybernetic implants. If the Institute inserted a set of ethics in dance, is it all that different from the ethics instilled in us by our parents, our church, or our schools? Technology invading human nature is a constant fear in real society, and constitutes the third myth espoused by the Brotherhood. Using tools is what allowed us to evolve into who we are today, and the technologies we developed along the way, like agriculture, architecture, and manufacturing, shaped us as much as we shaped the world with them. Before the synths, the Brotherhood manifested this fear in their distrust of technology, believing the pursuit of science to be a reckless transcending of human limitations and control. These monstrosities are just another example of man blindly taking a step forward only to wind up stumbling two steps back. Yet at no point does it register for them that flying around a blimp stocked full of nukes might also be an act of humans. The figure of the synth creates a rupture in our understanding of the human, complicating these myths. For Haraway, this is a good thing. Our rigid conception of human is what allows people to ostracize ghouls and enslave synths in Fallout, and has justified centuries of oppression against racialized others. Whoa, whoa, no ghouls in Diamond City. Get that thing out of here. Haraway argues for a cyborg politics, one that rejoices in the illegitimate fusion of animal and machine. In other words, instead of denying that we're cyborgs, we should embrace it. We're not only the fusion of flesh and machine, but society, history, and culture. The Institute, even if accidentally, manages to confront us with this pollution of the human. Father leaves you a synthetic version of himself for you to raise as your own child. 
The synths, who we're told are mere automatons, bristle for freedom regardless of their categorization. Even the fact that synths are built using actual human DNA further blurs these boundaries. Valentine, who is aware he is living with somebody else's memories planted in his artificial mind, struggles with what it means to be, knowing that he and his past are fabrications. Because I was Nick Valentine. I had his memories, his fears. All that poor bastard's hope. Then I discover all those things that they weren't even mine. All the good we've done, that's ours. And ours alone. And even if that's the only thing in this world that I can ever claim as mine, not Nick's, not the Institute's, but mine, then I can die happy. And then there's this speech from Dance. It's true. I was built within the confines of a laboratory. And some of my memories aren't my own. But when I saw my brothers dying at my feet, I felt sorrow. When I defeated an enemy of the Brotherhood, I felt pride. Don't you understand? I thought I was human, Arthur. Perhaps the most interesting lesson we can draw from Fallout 4 comes from the story of Pinocchio. In Pinocchio, a wooden marionette strives to become fully human. It's only when he learns the human traits of selflessness and honesty that he's finally transformed. Fallout offers a few parallels. There's Curie, who wants to become a real human. I must embark on a great adventure. I must become human. But settles for her brain being downloaded into a synth. Then there's the relationship between Father and the synth Sean he built, which somewhat parallels the relationship between Geppetto and Pinocchio. Do you think you could love him like you would a real boy? Both Dance and Valentine ground their claims in humanity, like the story of Pinocchio, in their human values. And what better metaphor for what it means to be human than a puppet who only becomes a human after he learns to obey his father and accept society's rules? Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you're looking for another post-apocalyptic property to dive into, head over to audible.com slash wisecrack and download The Gunslinger by Stephen King, the first book in the Dark Tower series. This is the book where King introduces Roland of Gilead on his spellbinding journey through a desolate world, which disturbingly mirrors our own. If you like deep, dark, end of the world as we know it type stuff, I'm sure you'll dig The Gunslinger. Audiobooks are a great way to make time fly, whether you're on a soul-crushing commute, working out at the gym or trying to avoid your friends and family over the holidays. Audible makes it easy to enjoy a huge selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, comedy, and more, no matter where you are. Just go to audible.com slash wisecrack to start your free 30-day trial. When you sign up, you can pick The Gunslinger or any book you want, download it for free, and it's yours to keep forever. For more about Audible and to start your free 30-day trial with a free audiobook, go to audible.com slash wisecrack to sign up. And thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. And we've got a ton more videos around the corner, including even more on Rick and Morty and South Park. To make sure you're in the loop, click here to visit our channel page and subscribe. While you're there, maybe check out our video on the philosophy of Darth Vader. And happy holidays, Wisecrack. Now that the year's coming to an end, I've got some major sleep to catch up on. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's all for now, y'all. Peace.